Thank you very much for this uh, very important and serious problem. We have a little time for discussion now, but anyway, yes, uh, Mr. Singer. A major problem, oops, sorry, a major problem of infrastructure because um, how long can organs be kept viable after they have been taken out? Is it possible to sh ship them over larger distances? Well, we, you can ship, it depends on the organ. There's a six hour window for a heart. There's about a 12 to 18 hour window for a liver. It's just, so there are some differences. But if you preserve the organ in an extracorporeal way, recover the organ, place it on a machine, it can be preserved for a longer period of time. Um, the infrastructure piece goes to sharing and within a certain region, for, like, for example, the United States. Um, there's a disparity in, this, in the individual that receives the transplant. And the focus these days in our infrastructure is to enable the, the liver or the kidney to be shipped afar into the person that is most needy, irrespective of the geography. So the, the ex vivo perfusion is going to expand opportunities for transit and for a duration of time of preservation to determine if the organ will function in advance of transplant. Okay, I hope that helps in an answer for the moment. Aspects of uh, xenotransplantation from pigs, uh, because it seems to me that's the only way to avoid uh, all these uh, uh, concerns. So, in the interest of time, we were talking. Bill and I were talking about this at lunch. The xenotransplantation for everybody in the room, the, the issue there is that we have natural antibodies to that organ on the blood vessels of the pig. As a molecule, it's a sugar molecule that we have this antibody and it results in an, a, a very immediate coagulation rejection of that organ. Pigs are now being genetically modified, Dr. Hashi, they're being modified so that that molecule is absent from the endothelium but the innate immune response is so potent, is so strong, that the, the, the pathways that attack that organ are still quite profound, robust. So we're not, we're not there. Uh, the research is continuing on, but it's not something that I anticipate in the next several years. On the stem cell piece, which is another question that might be, the, the research there is to take something like, look, take the heart, and it's decellularized. So we put tied, put tied to it, detergent, and it takes out all the cell, but the matrix is retained. Now if you take someone's uh, skin and you take their stem cells in a primordial way, the transcription factors that bring those cells back to a pluripotential cell, and you populate that strut, uh, that's something conceivable and being worked on it derives a contractility and pump, but it's not ready for transplantation. I would like to come back to the problem of the pig, because with the CRISPR-Cas technique, there are, there are uh, experiments that are going on now to eradicate uh, these antigens which are carried by the pork organs. Yes. And perhaps there is some, some hope uh, there, because there is, there is no hope to have enough organs <coughs> in a time, because as the level of uh, life is increasing, the, the, the people who need organ transplants is going to increase, and the people, the donors, are going to decrease. So the only hope is uh, xenotransplantation, or stem cells, perhaps. Thank you, Nicole. Well. <coughs> a question which I, I don't know how it easy it is to answer. So as you showed, there are vast disparities from country to country in the number of donations per death. Uh, how much of this is influenced by legislation, culture, and religion? You know, it's a very important point. 
There is no culture in the world that refuses a transplant. <coughs> so the claim that our culture doesn't accept death and donation, that culture enables its patients to go elsewhere, Colombia, Philippines, etc. There's no culture in the world that will make a prohibition from a cultural basis to accept an organ transplant. So it becomes somewhat hypocritical to make the association of culture as the reason why there's not a development of deceased donation in a particular country. Um, so I think there's a small religious exception like the Amish, for example, but I agree with you culturally fully um, that shouldn't be a problem. What I was wondering about is there are some countries who implement legislation like when you are an organ donor, you actually have higher priority to receive one. Is this something, do you see this backfiring? Is this working? Is this maybe a system that you can start to implement legislatively? Lisa, Lisa thanks for that question. The country of, of note in that is Israel. And it's a country of seven million people. And they have, they've had a particular problem in their patient population goes to Sri Lanka, Azerbaijan. It had been many a, m a month into the Philippines, etc. So yes, they've developed a legislatively a policy in which if you sign up to be a donor or your family member does, then you get some priorities and it gets a bit complicated. It's, a, it's not a simplified scheme, but the principle is there. I, I can tell you more about that off, offline. Yes. Um, 